A reading from the book of Amos. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. As if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Sometimes people will ask me how it is or what it was like to go through the discernment process. I explained that outwardly it was a process with lots of steps and therefore boxes to check off. Initially, I imagined the goal of the process was to thus complete the steps, check the boxes, and I would be ordained. In hindsight, and after having gone through it, I realized it was a process where the checks and the steps just don't matter. In the past week or so, I hit a period where it seemed like everything happened to fall at the same time. It also came at a time of an annual ministry event that I've served since 2015. Now, the event itself spans about 48 hours, but it requires a lot of focus and attention. And I'm pretty much busy for about 30 to 32 of those 48 hours. In short and in truth, but by the grace of God, I am standing here before you. Now, I also realize I'm not telling anybody anything very new. In fact, I'm pretty sure that each of us has these times. I think Sandy just mentioned one in the sacristy as we were lining up. And you just have to push through and maintain focus and then plan not to repeat those mistakes of overscheduling the next time. Most often when that type of thing happens, we rely on preparation and then training so we keep things on track. It does require practice to get used to being very, very busy all of a sudden. But it's also important because if you don't have a little handle on it, you could lose track and never catch up. Now, as we can see, it's a little bit on the nose, but as we can see, the gospel shows us what happens when we don't prepare. Our New Testament shows us the promise of what will come when we prepare and plan to serve as Christians. The hardest part of all the readings is in Amos. What happens when we prepare and plan and while we're preparing and planning, we realize we're planning for the wrong things, or we're planning improperly. This weekend, I worked with Laura as well, but also veterans, which is fitting for a Veterans Day weekend. But this was not a celebration gathering. It is the harsh reality of the work that some of our service men and women can face after all their training, post-traumatic stress. These highly trained, highly disciplined, highly prepared individuals show us that even with all that preparation, people can still be overcome by something training can't reach. The weekend 
is simply designed to be a new step in the right direction. It's a direction towards healing. And this specific ministry involves Christ, the Trinity. And often we find that that is one of the components that either never was or is often lost in the process. The veterans that are attending, of course, know very well that it's held at a Christian church. It's also led by an Episcopal priest. And even if there is no faith at all, no one's ever denied if they have a different belief or if they have different belief systems. But there is a hard understanding and the way the program works that we keep our Christian faith as a component of our life and as part of our practice in life, and specifically in this ministry, part of our healing. The short passage from Amos may seem to be one where the people of Israel are doing all the right things, but God's rejecting them, rejecting all these things that they were doing. What's often difficult to see is when the prophet shifts over and starts speaking on behalf of God. In this passage, it begins sounding like Amos and ends up sounding like God's words. What's interesting about this is there are likely 15 or 20 references to Scripture in these five or six verses. There are references to Exodus and Leviticus, and they all fit in. People then, the audience, would understand where Amos was speaking on behalf of God. It's, it's similar, I guess you would say, in a sense to the times like last week when we talked about the Sermon on the Mount. Most of us are familiar with those blessed statements and often can find them in other places crossing over in ministry, whether it be Paul's writings or the other Gospels. Amos is speaking on how God is to be followed and also pointing out that the Israelites are coming up just a bit short. The people of Israel are making the effort. They're doing the work, as it were, to fulfill the requests and promises that they are to make to God. The problem with it is they're kind of off track. They've gotten off base. One of those places that I use more in modern conversations is often related to the church, and I think it, it kind of comes close. I've often been asked about Advent and Lent. Now, we know they are penitential seasons, but people will always say, we're getting into Lent, and kind of like, you know, as we're approaching Advent, it seems a little depressing. Why does it have to be depressing? Well, it's a penitential season, so we have to be a little more focused. It doesn't have to be depressing, but it's also not a celebratory time. We're just a little bit off sometimes, and we need to refocus ourselves. Now, the Israelites themselves had three major feast days. And... In this short passage, they're referred to. That's those 20 or so references to earlier scriptures. The important thing to note is that they are doing their best to be faithful in the practices of those worship times, of those festivals. But what they're losing track of is that while they are good, those three days, and celebratory days, festival days, all the things are doing work out. It's the other 362 days where they're falling a little short. They don't seem to be getting the fact that it's not just three days a year they're to worship and follow God's directions. It's all of them. In a recent poll, and it's been over the past, it's been, I think, since 2004, there was a poll that was taken of Americans. And they were asked a simple question, do you believe that you will be going to heaven? 
What's very interesting about it is nearly 80% of the people were sure of it. Even more so interesting, there was only about a half to 1% that even mentioned the prospect of hell, Hades, the underworld, whatever you may refer to it. But it's virtually been removed from our conversation. Not that anybody should be that negative, but the fact is, is that it's not even recognized as an option. And for the Israelites, they were looking at their service and their work in the same fashion. They had eliminated the possibility of God not being there. What's also very interesting about this is when you do the quick math, there's 19% somewhere that aren't either. What happens with them? The Israelites fell a little bit short. As Christians, while we want to assure a place in this wonderful Thessalonians noted space of being with God, and while God's grace is enough, that work that Christ did for all of us, past, present, and future, just like the Thessalonians' beautiful imagery of the clouds and the heavens, we can be assured of. But that 19%, what do we do with them? How do we reach them? This is the part where I would refer back to the Israelites. And as Amos was trying to explain to them the work they have left to do, it's the same work we have left to do, whether it be 19%, whatever number you want to use. There are those who suffer in the world and those that have never seen or cannot see the light and love of God. We have work to do. No matter how busy we get, myself or anyone else, we have work to do. No matter whether or not the church here or anywhere else is in transition, or the diocese, nationally, internationally, whether we are stable and solid, whether we are considering how we plan to use our time, talent, and treasure in our day-to-day -day lives, we all have work to do. I mentioned that I worked with these veterans. They each have different work to do in their own experiences, work that their training and their service may have caused them to have what is known as a normal reaction to an abnormal circumstance. In the case of the people I spent time with over the weekend, the reaction is so severe that they can't get out of their own darkness. They need other support and assistance. Our weekend work is an incredible opportunity to share and show our support of those who feel that darkness, that isolation, that loneliness or solitude that can strike. Like with them, our work leaving here today from this place is to do the same. Maybe not with veterans, but with those who are isolated, who are alone. For those widows and orphans and homeless, for those who are sick and hurting, we must never make the assumption that we have a lock on our guarantee for that Thessalonian space. Amos was explaining to the people that their sacrifices and their festivals were not enough. They had to continue to live all 365 days of the year serving the Lord as they were called, 
we too must continually seek and serve the lost and the isolated and the lonely, those who are afraid. We cannot assume just our treasure will be enough. Just our talent will be enough. Or our time will be enough. And sometimes, like this weekend, we all get a little busy. It's part of it. As I gathered with these team members who I've served with many the whole time I've been there, to help these veterans put Christ back into their lives, find support systems where they can find resources everywhere from physical responses. I learned about ganglion nerves from one place. Amazing work being done to help stabilize and bring these people forward and out of the darkness. We also reminded them that there, that wasn't the end of it. Friday and Saturday was the beginning step. Today, tomorrow, and the next day, there are those that have committed support systems daily, weekly, monthly, where they continue and we continue to support those veterans in their progress out of darkness and into the light. Regardless of transitions or change, we need to take a look at our work and our commitment, both here in this church and here in this community. Winter's coming, it's getting cold, and it's noticeable. We need to consider our service of time, talent, and treasure as Christians. And we often use that image of the hundred sheep where 99 are found and one is lost. But we need the entire community, whether it's 80%, 19%, and 1%, 99 or one. We need the entire community to see and know the love of God. As I mentioned at the start of this, that being a Christian wasn't a requirement of this weekend. It never is. But for the first time this weekend, we had a man who was willing and strong enough, actually, to admit that he wasn't a believer in Christ. He wasn't a Christian, and what faith he had was gone. He had lost whatever faith was there, and he openly admitted in the beginning he was not prepared to take any step back in that direction. As I said, Nigel Mumford is the priest who runs this ministry. He took it on because he was a former Green Beret Royal Marine who was struck with the same afflictions two or three times during his service. He puts Christ in the center of things and it's very important to him. But at least for me, I was curious to see how this would go. A few times he had nudged at the man, asking him about faith and Christ. And the weekend went off as it should. People were being helped. I was listening to a lot of confessions and helping people as best I could. At the very end, before we go to a closing ceremony that is often, we try to keep it quiet from the veterans to welcome them home again to this first step. We have a prayer service we do individually where we take the veterans and their spouse or you know, veterans that come individually and we pray for them. Oftentimes we'll anoint them, ask them how we can pray for them at that point. We prayed for this man who had been hurting, who had seen a lot of combat, who had been successful in his life. And Father Nigel prayed with him, and at the end, he looked at the man and he said, would you be willing to take a step forward and accept Christ into your heart? Now, while this pause, after he asked that question, was probably only two or three seconds, for me, it felt like a half an hour. I, was on, I, I think I was actually on my toes. I didn't say that earlier. But I was almost leaning in. 
And very simply, the man said, yes. So I was like, oh, whew. But Nigel wasn't done there. He said, would you get down on your knees with me right now and pray with me? That was like an hour. And I think I started to sweat a little. <laughs> the man said, yes. And he got down on his knees. He then looked at him and he said, will you repeat these words with me? He said, yes. I was like, do you accept the Lord as your savior? I was ready to go. Let's go. This is a beautiful day. And I just started. And that prayer that he repeated faithfully, this man on his knees, it felt like it was war and peace. I'm like, come on, Nigel. I feel like we're going to lose him. No, I didn't have the faith in this case, and I'm being very honest when I say that. Nigel did, and so did that man. And line after line, beat after beat, he followed and said those words. A friend of mine sent a picture of him afterwards and said he looks like a light bulb lit up. There was a change, and that was wonderful. I don't know what today is going to bring for him. But that moment and trusting, as Nigel did, was a lesson for me. This man said yes for the first time, which is why I say yes to that ministry every time they ask. So I want you all to consider something when you leave this place today. This weekend, this man took a step forward. This was his first step towards a different life. My question for all of you is when you leave this place, what is your next step? Amen.